Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast and audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about a music legend, a band leader who could have been one of the all time greats had his brilliance not been snuffed out before his time. Only his untimely death wasn't brought about because he was black and gay, but owing to one of the most random of tragedies. Murder Mile is researched using authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock, and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 150, The Day the Music Died. Today, I'm standing outside the Café de Paris on Coventry Street, W1, one street west of the killing of David Knight, one street south of the unsolved shooting of Black Rita, one street east of the Blackout Ripper's failed attack on Greta Haywood, and a few doors down from the most radioactive shisha bar in the West End. Coming soon to Murder Mile, the book. Connecting Piccadilly Circus to Leicester Square, Coventry Street is an eyesore. A hideous boil on the West End's rear end, dotted with the ugly bum grapes of consumerism. Tourists flock here to see the real London, like fish and chips moaning and bad teeth, only to have their senses assaulted by a hodgepodge of tacky, un-British tat. Whether that's the mecca to sickly American sweets at M&M World. A lisping Asian Frank Sinatra impersonator who croons strangers in the night. Flanks of hairy Turks peddling Indian-made rickshaws as five Croatians on a stag do eat falafel, all while dressed as Pikachu. And lines of garish hellholes flogging off trashy trinkets. Like a princess dye car waxing kit a Queen Mum toenail clipper, a Prince Andrew wipe-clean diary as sponsored by Pizza Hut, and Police Constable Arsenal Guinness's personal favourite, a Princess Kate face flannel. Ooh, put me down for three. And although this particular street is a disgustingly lurid example of what happens when some of our worst cultural ideas are shared, when it's done properly, it can be what makes Britain truly great. In the basement of 3-4 Coventry Street sits the Café de Paris, an opulent music venue famed for jazz and swing orchestras, and it's here that the Charleston was introduced to London. Royals and regulars mixed, race and sexuality was unseen, and it hosted many famous names, such as Judy Garland, Dita Von Teese, Dorothy Dandridge, Marlena Dietrich, Louise Brooks, and Ken Snakehips Johnson. Ken was a band leader who was tipped to break through into the music mainstream, and the only reason he isn't regarded amongst the greats, like Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, and Glenn Miller, is owing to a series of random and almost unbelievable events which led to his untimely death. As it was here, on Saturday the 8th of March 1941, at roughly 9.45pm, that Ken Snakehips Johnson would entertain his last ever crowd. And although the music died, his memory would live on.
Legends aren't born fully formed. Some strive, some stutter, and some spurt. But whereas others like Ken would be so musically untalented, it's unbelievable that they would ever be hailed as an infamous band leader. As even his own musicians would state, he couldn't tell a B flat from a pig's foot. Although music wasn't his real gift, what he had in spades was personality and enthusiasm. Kendrick Reginald Hyams Johnson was born on the 10th of September 1914 in Georgetown, Guyana, a former British colony on the northeast coast of South America between Venezuela, Suriname and Brazil. With his mother a nurse and his father a doctor, as well as the Minister for Health, pressure was put on him to enter the medical profession. In 1929, aged just 14, this boy boarded the SS Nicaria and docked on the 31st of August in the British port of Plymouth. Being tall, skinny and clutching a small suitcase, Ken was alone in a foreign country with a population of 45 million, of whom barely 15,000, like himself, were black. And although this was the height of summer, the young boy shivered with cold and fear. To please his parents, Ken was privately educated at the Sir William Borlase Grammar School near Marlow in Buckinghamshire. Being bright, he excelled. Sprouting up to an impressive six foot and four inches tall, he stood out in a crowd. And being so personable, he was well liked. In 1931, it is said that he studied at Edinburgh University. Only there are no records to prove this. So either the files were lost, the archives have erased any evidence of a black student, or maybe, to shield his eager parents from the truth, Ken only said he studied there, but didn't. Music was in his blood which was unsurprising as his uncle was the pianist, Oscar Dumas. In 1932, he enrolled in the West End Dance School of Clarence Buddy Bradley, a successful African-American choreographer. And owing to Ken's lithe body and fluid dance style, the nickname of Snake Hips stuck. Touring Guyana, Trinidad and New York, Ken used this time to broaden his skills. He ingratiated himself with the latest dance and music styles. He formed his first all-black dance band, alongside saxophonist David Baba Williams. He honed his tap dancing amongst Harlem's finest. He drew inspiration from Bill Bojangles Robinson and his famous stair dance and idolizing Cab Calloway, he was inspired to become a band leader. Backed by a truly talented swing orchestra, Ken would bring his inimitable style and charm, as well as his fast feet and hypnotic snake hips, which always wowed the crowds. Ken Snake Hips Johnson would go on to shape the sound of swing across London in the 1930s and 40s. And having let trumpeter Leslie Thompson direct the music, as he couldn't tell a B-flat from a pig's foot, he had the gift of imparting his terrific enthusiasm to those who were talented. Returning to Britain in 1936, Later renamed as Ken Johnson and his West Indian Dance Orchestra, the band toured the variety club circuit. Being an all-black orchestra, this was certainly a selling point and a novelty for many British audiences. 
seeing musicians from such exotic climes as Jamaica, Sierra Leone, Trinidad, South Africa, Cape Verde, and with some hailing all the way from South Wales. But being unwilling to sully the mix by adding a white face, as they couldn't find two suitable trombonists, Greg Amor and Freddie Greenslade, two pasty white musicians, had to wear blackface makeup to blend in. Becoming famous fast, they became the resident house band at the old Florida club in Mayfair, played gigs at the Shepherd's Bush Empire, did stints on BBC World Service, where they rose to the rank of stars, and recorded their first discs. Goodbye, remember, Washington squabble, and please be kind. By 1939, Ken wasn't even 24 years old, but he was already a band leader, an entertainer, a famous name, and a well-known face. He was widely respected by the industry and audiences. He was on a good wage, and he had a natural gift in an era for whom the music of swing was about to explode. Everything could have gone so wrong for Ken in so many ways. Being a black man from a former enslaved colony, Britain wasn't the most welcoming place for Ken. In 1863, the president of the London Anthropological Society had stated, the Negro, the Negro is intellectually inferior to the European and can only be civilized by Europeans. A statement many still believed. By the 1940s, barely 20,000 black people had made Britain their home, with many eking out a living in badly paid jobs in some of the most deprived areas. By the 1950s, of a thousand landlords surveyed, only 15 would let a room to a black person who had to pay double the rent of a white person. Persecution was widespread, segregation had become the norm, and denied all but the most menial of jobs. Black people were banned from entering many clubs, except as waiters and performers to white audiences. And even then, a black musician in an all-white band could be problematic, as the venues had the legal right to block their inclusion. So performing in an all-black band was truly groundbreaking. To overcome this ingrained bigotry, Ken strove harder than most and pushed the band to excel. The music was impeccable. Their professionalism was unparalleled. His showmanship was second to none. And for maximum impact, the band wore bright white dinner jackets with black bow ties. Establishing Ken Johnson and his West Indian Dance Orchestra as one of the best swing bands in Britain. Only being black wasn't the only issue which made his life hard, as Ken was also gay. In the 1930s, it was illegal to be gay, a crime to admit to being a homosexual. Laws were drafted which pigeonholed gay sex alongside such moral debauchery as prostitution, incest and bestiality. And the consensual sex between two adults of the same gender wouldn't be decriminalized for almost another 30 years. His sexuality was a secret he kept hidden from his family and all but his closest of friends. And for good reason, too. In 1940, Ken met and fell in love with Gerald Hamilton. Widely regarded as the wickedest man in Europe, Gerald's former flatmate was the infamous occultist Alistair Crowley. He acted as an informer for Sinn Féin, Special Branch and the British Military Mission in Berlin and served prison time for bankruptcy, theft, gross indecency and was seen by MI5 
as a threat to national security. Only Ken wasn't a political dissident, hell-bent on underpinning the state. What drew him to Gerald, a man 20 years his senior, was his fascinating life, his Edwardian airs, and his malicious anecdotes. The two were like chalk and cheese. But being in love, in 1941, they moved in together at 91 Kinnerton Street in Belgravia, and later bought a cottage in Little Bassing in Bray, overlooking the River Thames. Besides, it wasn't like Ken could hide in the shadows. As being an elegant and handsome gentleman, half a foot taller than most males, his electrifying personality was his calling card. Ken was a star whose bright light was about to blow supernova. But even the brightest of stars don't get to twinkle for long. And that consequently, this country is at war with Germany. The year was 1939. The world was at war, and Ken's plans for an overseas tour were scuppered. With British musicians conscripted to fight, his West Indian band were in high demand. But with theatres shut and nightclubs closed, as bombing raids ravaged the city, Westminster Council issued very few licences for fear of public safety. So with gigs in short supply, many musicians found other work. But Ken wasn't about to give up. Opened in 1924, Café de Paris was the epitome of sophistication. With its ballroom and supper club, modelled on the opulent interiors of the Titanic, and featuring an oval mirrored dance floor and elevated stage, encircled by ornate curved staircases, it was the night spot for London's society elite. Given a license, its owner, Martin Polson, would hail it as one of the safest and gayest places in town. Built below the Rialto Cinema, with four stories of stone and steel above, hidden underground and encased in concrete, it dodged the blackout rules and, it is said, was impenetrable to the Luftwaffe's bombs. On the 5th of November 1940, Café de Paris reopened to great fanfare. Having stockpiled 25,000 bottles of champagne, even as the shockwaves shook its foundations, the people danced. Because as hard as he tried to break the British spirit, this party was a big fuck you to Adolf Hitler. To aid the war effort, Café de Paris was requisitioned as a place of recreation for active servicemen. To return a sense of normality to a wider audience, not just its usual clientele like the Mountbatten's, the Aga Khan, Cole Porter and King Edward VIII, it lowered its prices. And it also played host to many of Britain's finest comedians, such as Frankie Howard, Tommy Cooper, Tony Hancock and Benny Hill as well as Peter Sellers, Harry Seacombe and Spike Milligan from The Goon Show. Not to mention a whole host of famous musicians, singers, dancers, performers and band leaders. During wartime, Café de Paris was the perfect place to be. It was friendly, popular and safe. Bursting into the starlight, Ken Johnson and his West Indian Dance Orchestra were snapped up as the resident band for the Café de Paris, often kicking off the night or headlining at the top of the bill. With the venue fitted with state-of-the-art recording equipment, the band's popularity rose 
and their shows were broadcast on BBC Radio and the BBC World Service. But success wasn't the only boon for Ken. As being a respected artist, he had the power to showcase any new and upcoming talents, many of whom, being black and or female, would previously have been denied this opportunity, and this helped bridge the gap between music, business and oppression. Six months into the Blitz, the British were yet to surrender as the bombing continued. So as they all went about their everyday lives, the Luftwaffe targeted smaller cities, giving Britain a little breathing space. For Ken and his band, they had settled into a comfortable life in the rumble-strewn chaos of the West End. The gigs were good, the pay was solid, the crowds were appreciative, and their popularity was rising. Saturday the 8th of March 1941 was an ordinary day. Having awoken late, Ken had caught the riverboat from the cottage he shared with Geraldine Bray to Embankment, where he did some shopping and met a few friends for drinks at the Embassy Club on Old Bond Street. At roughly 9.20pm, he politely excused himself, as although they wanted him to stay for one more drink, as he and his band were due to be on stage at 9.45pm, Ken would never dream of being late. And there is an irony, as had he not been the epitome of professionalism, he may have lived. At 9.25pm, he exited the Embassy Club in Mayfair, with the Café de Paris being less than a mile away, roughly a 15-minute walk. He considered hailing a cab, but as the streets were busy, and although relatively famous, being a black man, the chances of him getting a taxi were slim. He chose to walk. Had he waited, he may have been late, and maybe have lived. Strolling towards Piccadilly, there was no real panic in Ken's lengthy strides. As like everyone else, 18 months into the war, they heard the bombers and felt the blasts. But being finely tuned to know where they were heading, how close they were, and how long it took to run to the nearest air raid shelter. So commonplace had the Blitz become that avoiding a bomb was like catching a bus. Had he sought to seek safety in an air raid shelter, he may have lived. But he'd also have missed the start of his show. At roughly 9.40pm, Ken arrived at the Café de Paris. He dressed in his tailored white tails with a bright majestic flower in his buttonhole and grabbed his slightly oversized black baton. With the patrons either seated, supping chilled champagne or eager to groove, even though the bombers loomed closer and the explosions grew louder, from the safety of the club, the party was about to kick off. At 9.45pm, Snake Hips and his swing band entered the stage. The bombing wasn't particularly heavy that night. Around 130 tons of high explosives and 30,000 incendiaries pummeled the West End, as it had many times before. With British anti-aircraft batteries positioned in the parks, unleashing a volley of flak, many German bombers flew outside their range at 20,000 feet. Therefore, the chance of a bomb hitting its target was slim. But this bombing campaign was no longer about precision. It was about maximum casualties. 
at roughly the same time, the Ken instructed his band to play the opening bars of the Andrew Sisters hit, Oh Johnny. A squadron of Heinkel HE-111s had loomed over the blacked out gloom of Piccadilly. As many bombs exploded across Regent Street, Shaftesbury Avenue and Haymarket, several hit Coventry Street. Dropped from high up in the troposphere, two SC-50 50 kilogram high explosive bombs fell at a rate of 400 feet per second. Being 110 centimeters long and 20.3 centimeters wide, to aid its direction and flight, as air rushed along its spiraled fins. This forced the projectile into a fast rotation, causing it to nosedive. So as it gained speed, it would hit the ground at maximum velocity, detonating the explosive warhead in its tip. By chance, these two bombs missed the glass roof of the Rialto. They missed the stone and steel structure of the building above. And they both missed the concrete reinforced ceiling of the club. But being in a basement, with no windows and few doors, to expel the noxious gases from the kitchen and to supply the customers with fresh air, the club was fitted with one meter wide ventilation shafts. Had the bombs fallen flat, they would only have damaged the roof of an empty cinema, as many of them had. But falling tip first, scoring an almost impossible bullseye into two different vents, both bombs flew straight down the four floors of the ventilation shaft and landed in the packed club below. Thankfully, one bomb hit the dance floor and failed to explode. But the other did not. In a blinding blue flash, a bomb exploded in the gallery above the band. Packed with 23 kilos of TNT, its steel shells shattered, firing hundreds of hot dense fragments in every direction piercing anything in its path, whether glass or brick, bone or flesh. 80 people were injured, many seriously. Survivors told the press of cuts, burns and broken bones, but many stories were too grim to be shared. One patron witnessed her lover's back blown out as they sat eating supper. One saw a lady in a green dress, sat at the bar with a champagne in hand, too shocked to realize that her other arm had been blown off. And a rescuer tripped over a girl's head, only to see her decapitated body still sitting in a chair. 30 people died, including the club's owner Martin Paulson the head waiter, several staff and diners, and the band saxophonist David Baba Williams, as well as the band leader himself, Ken Snakehips Johnson. Being at the front of the stage, entertaining the crowd with his mesmerizing hips and fluid dance style, as the bomb ignited from his shoulders down, his lithe body was cut in half by the blast. The band's guitarist, Joe Denise, later said, The next thing I remember was being in a small ambulance, as bombs lit up Dean Street. And then someone came to me and said, Ken's dead. It broke me up. The rescue was hampered by confusion, so as civilians and off-duty medics fought to save lives, the looters descended. Nabbing purses, 
swiping bottles, filching the pockets of the dying, and cutting off fingers to steal the rings of the dead. The Westminster ARP declared the incident as closed at 11 p.m. Civil engineers stated the structure as unsafe, and being forcibly shut, the Café de Paris wouldn't reopen its doors for another seven years. The next day, Gerald Hamilton, Ken's lover, was informed of his death and asked to identify the body at Westminster Mortuary. Oddly, although Ken had been decapitated, most of his body was unmarked, parts of his suit were still white, and even his little flower in his buttonhole was untouched. Ken's funeral was held on the 14th of March 1941 at Golders Green Crematorium, with his ashes placed in the chapel of the Sir William Borlase Grammar, where he went to school. For the rest of his life, Gerald kept a picture of Ken with him at all times, and called him my husband until his death. There was a huge outpouring of love in the press. Melody Maker paid endless homage to Ken in the weeks after his death, and all by it belatedly, the BBC broadcast a memorial one year later. But being too devastated, traumatized, and in many cases injured, the band broke up and never played again. The impact that Ken Snake Ips Johnson had on swing, the innovation of sound, and the elevation of black talent can never be understated. But given that he was only 26 years old when he tragically died, this begs a question. What could he have achieved had he missed his death by mere minutes? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. As always, if your favourite part of the show isn't the bit which takes days to research, write and edit, but is the pointless bit where a fat bald man talks crap and makes tea, Stay tuned till after the break for more info on this case and a little quiz. But before that, here's a little promo. Did you hear about the Welsh tourists who got drunk and stole a penguin named Dirk from SeaWorld on the Gold Coast? Or the Canadian guy who tried to beat a breathalyzer test by eating his own underpants? Hey, I'm Tara Saraban from World's Dumbest Criminals, an upbeat podcast about deadbeat crims. Join me every Monday to hear about the most ridiculous, bizarre and downright stupid crimes and criminals in the world ever. Like the Australian man who put out an unsuccessful hit on his wife and freaked out when she crashed her own funeral. Or the Chinese woman who deliberately ran 49 red lights in her ex-boyfriend's car. World's Dumbest Criminals is available on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss any criminally stupid shenanigans. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Gaz Porter and Phelps Boyce. I thank you for supporting the show. It's very much appreciated. You now get access to loads of exclusive goodies... Plus, you also get to hear that episode of Walk With Me, where I get attacked by a horsefly. Ooh, exciting. And if you like this story and you want to learn more about Ken Snake Hips Johnson, check out the Soho Bites podcast starring the lovely Dom DeLarge. It's an excellent podcast for fans of classic movies and local history. Also, he's a jolly nice chap to share a pint with. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. That is that. How long was that? It wasn't wasn't horrific. It wasn't horrific. It didn't stutter as much as I normally would do that. Oh shit! I might have just looked.
lost my cable let's check are you still recording you are still recording that's good hey everyone welcome to extra mile uh how are we all we all good and well and healthy and happy and etc uh, etc et which is important isn't it it's important i think that's the priority in life that people seem to forget be be healthy and happy actually if you're happy it improves your health don't worry be happy um talking about being happy i am going to go and put on a, a quaffy quaffy and cake let's go open some curtains as well because it's getting a bit it's getting a bit meaty in here at the moment uh so all had to, oops had to uh stop the record not stop the recording but silence it a little bit because coot opposite uh who is currently sitting on a canoe uh was being a bit mouthy uh, in the old place I was moored up in, we had uh, a duck. Tells the breeze, a duck on the canal. Uh, but he was every morning, he was bah, 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 really noisy. Now we've got a little coo opposite, but he doesn't seem that bad. I think he was just having a bit of a moment. Uh, and then the seagulls popped up, uh, flying over, they're quite noisy. And as I found out behind me, someone seems to own a cockerel. So for an hour, you have a cockerel going, uh, telling you that it's morning, even though, I'm sorry cockerels, but we all know it's morning. It's like, it's not like you're doing anything special. You're literally just going, cock a doo wake up everyone, it's morning. And we all go, yeah, we can see that, you bastard. It's like the sun's coming up. You're not doing anything special. Anyway, what's going on? Um, cake, of the, cake of the day, I say, I mean, I'll probably have three or four today. I picked up a nice donut at Wenzel's yesterday, although I did ask for two, and every time I ask for two, they give me one. I don't know why Wenzel's do that. It's like I go in and I have one, and then they go, oh, no, I'll have two. And they always forget the second one. I think they only hear the first things. Anyway, I'm going to tuck into a nice jammy donut very shortly. Um, if you enjoy cakes, don't forget on... Uh, uh, if you're on Patreon every Sunday at lunchtime, I do a cake of the week. Ooh, a nice little video where we have a look at a nice cake. Ooh, just filmed last yes next week's one yesterday. That was good. And then I scoffed them both. What else is going on in the world? Not much. Just moved the boat to a new location that I normally wouldn't moor up in. It's all right here. i uh, got a different part of Crossrail behind me. So hence I'm up early because when it gets to 8 o'clock in the morning, all you hear is bang. And that continues for, I think it's it's about 10 hours straight and it's really horrible. Uh, and also, the, the, I'm opposite some houses and there's a nice garden out back. But yesterday, there was someone in their garden and they were facing the canal and they got a coat on and literally were peering over their fence just staring at me for an hour. It's really weird, really creepy. Uh, what else is going on? Not much. It's getting a bit cold. Uh, not cold enough to put the fire on. I don't reckon that'll be on for another couple of weeks yet. I'm yet to get to the point where I'm in bed wearing wearing a hat. That sometimes does happen because I'm. I, I I like to I like to feel the, I like to enjoy the fire. I like to to wait and go. Okay, now now it's five o'clock. Uh, how's water doing? It's almost there. It's almost there. Uh, let's pop that in into my instant coffee. Oh yum! Instant coffee, sugar powdered milk. There we go. Not cold enough for, for proper milk yet. Also, I'm, I've gone off kind of proper milk anyway. Cow tick tit lactations. Uh, what else is going on? Oh, just to say, uh, we're up to the final last ever Murder Mile Walked of this incarnation. Don't forget the new ones. I hope to have something up and running for them, kind of spring or summertime. I haven't really got a date for that yet. But... Just to say, the reason why I'm doing these final walks, if you've if you've got vouchers that you haven't used them up, use them up now. Uh, if they're at a date, just just message me and I'll, I'll sort you out. That won't be a problem. If you can't fit into any of these dates, email me and I can transfer those tickets to the new walk. So when the new walk happens, I'll just email you and go, hey, here's the new walk, come along. What else is going on? Um, started listening to a new podcast called Bad Women by uh, Hayley Rubinold. It was very good. She did the the, uh, the book called The Five about the 
the five alleged uh, canonical victims of the Jack the Ripper. And as I've mentioned before, it's a very good book of which she goes, who gives a fuck about who Jack the Ripper is? And she just focuses on the lives of the five women. And she dispels a lot of the myths that are out there created by a lot of the assholes who, I'm sorry, refer to themselves as Ripperologists. I think people seem to believe that if you add the word ologist or ology on the end, it makes something official. Ugh. Anyway, um, it's a really good, really good podcast called Bad Women. If you like that book, you'll enjoy this as well. It's for open minded people who like facts, not theories. Uh, so uh, give it a go. I really enjoy it. And not because she sounds like Eva. Well, when I listen to it, it's weird. I keep inspecting her to uh, tell me off and go, where's my cocktail? Where's my cocktail? Why, why have I got another hangover? So, uh, yeah, but it's a very good podcast. She's she gets quite angry about a lot of the the bullshit that's out there that ripologists purport to be fact and it isn't that's what makes it quite an interesting podcast is she's a she's not afraid to call people out on their bullshit and unfortunately with the jack the ripper case there is a lot of bullshit uh right let's go into the quiz questions don't forget this is often the part that i may balls up slightly but that's not a problem at all uh or i might edit out some of a section in the podcast which means the question is redundant but because this is an unedited part of the show that's uh etc etc i couldn't be asked to finish that sentence okay question number one uh which country did ken come from there was a lot of K's and C's in that. Which country did Ken come from? Question two. Which band leader did Ken idolise? And that's band leader as in did, 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 not someone who was banned, obviously. Uh, uh, question three. Which club was Ken having drinks at before his death? Question four. What did Ken's parents do as jobs? His dad technically had two jobs. But I'll let you off. You can have you can have one job for him. Uh, question five: Who? Uh, question five: Who owned the West End Dance School that Ken attended? Mm. I spent ages trying to find the location of this dance school, and I cannot. I think he moved a lot. Uh, question six: Which university did Ken probably go to? Question seven. How many bottles of champagne were stockpiled at the ca for the Café de Paris opening? Question eight. Name one of the discs Ken's band released. So I mentioned four. You can name any of them. Oh. Question nine. Uh, which uh, his musician said Ken couldn't tell a B flat from a what? And question 10, which famous occultist was Ken's boyfriend? Hang on, hang on, redo that. Question 10, which famous occultist was Ken's boyfriend, Gerald, a former flat, a former flatmate with? Fuck now. Uh, so Ken's boyfriend, Gerald, had a form, had a flatmate previously. Who was it? That's probably another way of saying it. Right, let's dive into the extra stuff. Let's burn my lips on some coffee. Oh, hot hot um i'm gonna dive into some stuff to do with the bombing i think we've pretty much covered everything we could with um uh, ken ken's early life there's there's some really good books out there if you want to read more about ken's life uh there's an interesting uh, um, i think there's an observer article that came out years ago i think it's called the sultan of swing that's really good uh, but let's dive into some some stuff. So, uh, as mentioned, it's pretty bizarre. The, the 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 bombing campaign happened. People could hear it coming over. Uh, it seemed to be coming, heading north through Piccadilly, and then was kind of, as they said, heading up kind of Dean uh, Dean Street. So hiding kind of north uh, northeast ish. Um, bombs did hit the top of the Rialto. Uh, obviously, because it was uh, because many people hadn't kind of got licenses, the the cinema wasn't open at that point, which is kind of kind of lucky, really, because imagine how many people would have died at that point. They also said that um, because it was nine forty five, 
it was still quite early. So Ken was doing, uh, Ken and his orchestra were doing the opening, but they were also headlining as well. So they opened the show. Um, the the ballroom itself was actually only about half full by that point because people were kind of went, you know, when the pubs shut, people would have turned up. So they said if the bombing would have happened about an hour later, it would have been absolutely packed. Uh, so there would have been a lot more dead. So actually, in a way, they're kind of quite lucky that it didn't. But it's kind of the irony with this. I had to double check all the data on this of how the bombings took place. Bombs um, were being dropped, probably from the Heinkels. There might have been a couple of uh, Junkers in there as well that were flying. Um, bombs were dropped all over the street. You can kind of see the progression when you look at the bomb maps. Uh, many hit the top of the Rialto. There's a lot of damage to the top of the Rialto, especially not just uh, the glass roof, but uh, some of the uh, structure. But because it was quite a solid structure, a lot of it didn't collapse because it was a uh, stone and steel. When you look at the pictures of it, you can see that it is it is a solid building. Uh, but unfortunately two of the bombs as mentioned did make it into the uh, ventilation shafts um, when you look at the bombs the bombs were 110 centimeters long and 20.3 centimeters wide so which is why I, I did that whole section about the fact that when the bombs are designed to slightly spin and rotate because when they fall out of an aircraft they go flat and they wobble a bit and it's kind of you see them wobble as they're falling and that's because they're trying to find their feet then all of a sudden the wind gets underneath one of the the tail fins which are slightly spiraled which means when the wind hits it it causes it to turn and when it turns it it goes into a rotation and that way the bomb drops immediately directly down so it's not going flat it goes head first and because 23 kilos of tnt is in, in the um you got the detonator, then you got the explosive after that, and then you've got the bomb itself, which is uh, that would be twenty-seven uh, kilos of steel. You know, that's that's a massive projectile there. So it, the idea is that it hits the floor head first, goes boom, and then explodes. Uh, we don't know why the first one didn't explode. Maybe the maybe the detonator was faulty. Maybe it landed the wrong way. So do you know, it, it may have it may have flipped sometimes if the bombs flip and go the wrong way if, if the debt if it doesn't hit the detonator smack bang sometimes it doesn't explode which is why they find a lot of undetonated bomb, bombs all the time as it's going through a building it probably could don't forget it could probably hit stuff bounce different directions uh but unfortunately two of them managed to make it into the ventilation shafts the ventilation shafts were roughly around a, a, a meter wide there was kitchens in there um and obviously they needed fresh air for all the people that were in there. So, you know, given the size of the building, it had to have ventilation shafts. And it's just it's just unfortunate luck that they made their way into the ventilation shafts and found their way all the way down through the re reinforced concrete and all the buildings above. Um, and when you look at the pictures of it, you can see how it, it's quite a small ballroom. So everything's quite tight. Everything's quite condensed. Uh, and I think that was part of the problem as well is when you've got a, a if it was a big open building and the bomb exploded you'd have less damage but because it's a contained building and it's smaller the shock waves bounce off everything else and, and it's often the shock waves that cause a lot a lot more trouble um, it's, like, it's like when you look at the uh, assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler by uh, Count von Staffenberg the, the fact that they, they changed the rooms at the last minute from uh, a bunker room into a more open room because it was a hot day and it's actually they, they said you know even though the bomb was next to him because it was an open room and it got windows the the shockwaves were able to dissipate whereas had the bomb exploded anywhere near hitler in a bunker because of the because of the thick concrete walls he would have been eviscerated um so unfortunately that's what happened to a lot of people here a lot a lot of people were killed by shrapnel um uh, as mentioned, Mester and the restaurateur, the guy who owned it, Martin Poulsen, was died, died outright as the club's head waiter. Uh, when you look at the pictures, um, the 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 pictures posted by the press, obviously they have to be really careful about this. So they've posted a lot of pictures of furniture destroyed, instrument cases, stage decorations, you know, uh, you know, bottles of wine broken, things like that. They they can't show pictures of all the dead people, quite rightly. 
Uh, the, and unfortunately, the um, parts of the staircase were demolished, and the staircase went uh, from the dance floor round the back of the stage and was the way out. So a lot of people, even though the bombs had gone off, gone off, they they couldn't actually. Um, many struggled to get out, and also, a lot of the uh, rescue teams uh, uh, struggled to make their way in as well. Ah, uh, what else have we got? Um, so. Yeah, exploded. Uh, the one landed on the dance floor. God, if that would have gone off, that would have been absolutely horrific. Um, but the one that did go off went off immediately above the band, which is why many of the band were kind of... Uh, m many of the band were saved because kind of the platform of the floor kind of protected some of them, but injured others. I think I've got a list of their injuries here. Unfortunately, because Ken was at front of stage... Um, he was killed outright uh what else have we got uh, so i got loads and loads and loads of details on this and i just don't want to bore you with too much stuff uh as they mentioned it was a quite a horrific scene inside there um many diners were killed sitting at their tables instantly um uh, the the uh, escapes uh, the, as mentioned, the, the kind of escapes, uh, were, uh, it was hard to escape from there. Uh, they had cabaret dancers on stage at the time. Uh, they, unfortunately, they were, many of them were injured as well. Many actually didn't go back to work after that. Um, I found loads of accounts online of people whose kind of parents and grandparents were there. So I used a lot of the, the different details that were in. Uh, one person mentioned that uh, his mother, father and uncle went down into the ballroom uh, and they said they saw a young woman sitting at the bar in an emerald green dress. Uh, one of her arms had been blown off. Uh, and she had a glass of uh, fizzy uh, champagne in the other hand. And they said by the look on her face, she was just in total shock. She had really no idea what was going on. Um, Ken Johnson was killed instantly. Uh, as mentioned, the saxophonist, uh, David Bab Baba Williams, who he'd he'd set up the band with years ago so they'd been together for about 10 years uh ken johnson was uh they they say cut in half but he was kind of cut in he was kind of cut kind of um around roughly around shoulder height which is why the his buttonhole was still in place um the band's guitarist joe denise later said uh, as we started playing there was an awful thud all the lights went out the ceiling fell in and the plaster came pouring down People were yelling. Um, a stick of bombs went right across Leicester Square, through the Café de Paris and further up Dean Street. The next thing I remember was being in a small van which had been converted into an ambulance. Then someone came to me and said, Joe, Ken's dead. It broke me up. Um, uh, we still don't know whether uh, some of these stories that we, we've heard are true. Like the the, the, the one about the... the uh, the rescue worker going in and tripping over the girl's head which was on the floor and then looking up and seeing that her torso was still in the chair there's a lot of talk about people who died in their seats and uh, the the severe injuries that they suffered so it is likely but uh, obviously the um, the archive files are kind of hard to get hold of um, as for the band members um, uh, one of them had a broken wrist. Uh, Joe Denise and Bromley both had broken legs. Uh, D'Souza had splinters of glass in his eye near his pupil. Um, uh, what else have we got? Uh, as mentioned, there was a bit of a confusion at the start. The initial emergency response to the Café de Paris was uh, seriously flawed. A message was sent from the scene to uh, Westminster Control Centre was misinterpreted. Um two heavy rescue parties a mobile aid post two stretcher parties and two ambulances were soon on their way to coventry street uh but they realized that there was a need for more ambulances and stretchers because they'd severely underestimated uh how many they needed and don't forget this is it's not like you could just call up some more ambulances this is in the middle of a blitz and uh, a bombing campaign so they're probably badly scattered uh, so it took almost over an hour for the uh enough ambulances to survive don't forget this is in an era before paramedics it was kind of during world war ii uh and especially during things like uh the korean war in vietnam that kind of uh paramedics kind of came into the forefront because prior to that um people who uh 
mostly they were just ambulance drivers who'd been given a little bit of uh, medical training, but they weren't the specialists as they are now. Do you know, paramedics turn up now, they're like first on the scene. They're, they, they're absolutely critical. But in those days, the job of the ambulance driver was basically patch people up and get them to hospital as quick as possible. Uh, da, 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 da. What else have we got? What else have we got, Michael? Uh, many of them were taken to uh, Charing Cross Hospital, which was the original Charing Cross Hop Hospital, which was just around the corner. Um, rescuers. Rescuers were there. Obviously, they uh, because of the bombing, they, they were any, unable to get water, so they had to use uh, champagne to clean many of the wounds. Um, th a lot of people talked of, of how horrific the scenes were inside um one of the people who oh hang on this was um uh, uh, was just was it? these were some of the things that i found online by people who said they were there one of them said uh, my grandfather major tommy lee was killed whilst on leave from active duty in france he took my granny out there for dinner uh, there that night and their table was right next to the band apparently his back was blown out uh, as he sat opposite my granny thankfully betty granny walked away unharmed as tommy's body guarded her from the blast he was tw he was 36 years old uh what's this one so there's loads in here I, um, I i went searching to try and find all these all these different stories um as mentioned, I kind of briefly mentioned in there that uh, there was a lot of looting going on. Don't forget, this isn't in an era where everyone le there's rose-tinted glasses and everyone goes, oh, you can leave your doors open. Everybody knew each other. As you've seen with the Blackout Ripper, people didn't give a shit about their neighbours. Same as kind of now. Some you do, some you don't. But, but I'm sure in 50 years' time, we'll all be looking back at this era and go, oh, yeah, we all left our doors open. Yeah. Oh. Do you know, that rose-tinted idea of, of what war was. Um, so um unfortunately this was a, a common problem at the time so uh when there would be uh a bombing during the blitz the police would turn up and you would think that the police's job uh would first be kind of go in and check for check that everyone's okay and you know see who's alive and dead unfortunately uh, because of the risk of looters police who normally would be first on the scene their job normally was just to guard the premises to keep the looters away so you actually ended up having to have two, uh, twice as many police on scene one to kind of help with the arp wardens and things like that but mostly just to stop the looters turning up because because there would be uh, opportunists who would see it and go oh, look at look at all their stuff oh well their buildings open i'll steal all their stuff but there are also gangs and that's what they specialized in Do you know uh they could turn up and I read one article recently where they they said, you know, they could they could strip a house in about ten minutes. They would turn up with their van, strip it, and before even the ARP people would turn up or the police, everything would be gone. Because um, as far as they were concerned, it was theirs. Um, so yeah, looters turned up. They were rummaging through all the coats and handbags of the victims. Uh, they took jewelry off corpses. There were. Uh, it was said that you know fingers were being cut off. One of the people who was there, uh, who was working as a special constable at the time, was uh, Ballard Barclay, who some people may uh, recognise as the uh, the major from Forty Towers. Uh, so he was working there at the point, and he gave a. Uh, um, this is Joe. You know, he was still a young actor by that point, so he uh, he was early in his career, and he gave a, a lot of reports to the police because he was one of the first on the scene. And he said, uh, "In such a confined space, the force was tremendous. It blew heads and legs off and exploded their lungs." One hears a lot about the bravery during the war, but there were some uh, very nasty people. These people slipped in pretty quickly, uh, and it was full of people: firemen, wardens, police. Uh, so it was very easy to cut off a finger here and steal a necklace. Uh, uh, what else have we got? Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he go on to say that there's a real, you know, the worst of human nature was in evidence. He, he said he saw, that night he saw the best and the worst, you know. People really coming together to help each other out, you know. People with no medical experience trying to do their best to save people's lives. And then scumbags turning up to you know steal whatever they feel is theirs unfortunately some people in the world believe that uh they're, they're entirely selfish and they only think about themselves and you know what fuck them 
I think I think I might uh, wear uh, I might make us some awesome badges and something that just says a badge that just says you know what fuck them <laughs> um what else have we got uh yeah so as mentioned the police spent most of the time uh chasing off the looters as did the air raid wardens as well uh, what else have we got let's done that bit done that bit done that bit uh city of westminster arp declared the incident as closed at 11 p.m at least 34 staff band members and patrons were killed and they they said there was roughly around 80 people uh who were injured uh gerald had to identify the body um uh, he got a phone call on the morning of the 9th of March 1941, so that's the next morning. Uh, they called him because that was kind of uh, his next of kin address. Obviously, he hadn't got family in this country, as far as we know. Um, uh, as mentioned, he kept a, uh, a photo of um, Ken uh, with him at all times until the day he died. Uh, the funeral took place 14th of March 1941 in Golders Green Crematorium. The ashes were placed back in his school uh, so, um, over in Marlow. Um, so clearly he had a, a lovely time at his school. It's interesting that there's no reference to his family after this. Um, no reference to his mum and dad. He did go black, back to uh, his uh, home country. I must ruin the question then. Uh, but there seems to be no, no reference to them at his funeral. Whether they were, I don't know. Um, but uh, it says, uh, Friends, colleagues and other mourners gathered um, at Agri House, the social centre for studies of African descent, um, for students of Af African descent, uh, that has become a base for political organising. Uh, Johnson's impact went beyond the world of jazz. He contributed to the creation of the establishment of entertainment opportunities for black musicians. Um, when, jo uh, when Johnson's residency at the old Florida club ended in 1938, the band was succeeded uh, by another non-white band led by Charles uh, Olufella. I've mispronounced that. Um, which was kind of a first then and they, they said kind of after that kind of having kind of an all black band even though even though technically ken's band wasn't all all black um it, it kind of became kind of uh kind of a norm after that uh what else have we got what else have we got as mentioned um um the band broke up afterwards uh many were devastated and traumatized and uh, many were still badly injured afterwards uh uh harry Parry, that's his actual name, uh, the Welsh band leader, hired Denise D'Souza and Wilkins for his radio rhythm sextet, while uh, Barito uh, started a mixed swing orchestra in 1942. Hutchinson worked with the band leader, Geraldo, for three years. What was the, the bit I found? They did a memorial. Uh, tributes. Um, nice tribute to um, in Melody Maker. Uh, for Ken Johnson and his band. This went on for about three weeks after his death, uh, but it wasn't until September 1941 um, that the BBC decided to broadcast a memorial to uh, Ken on the Radio Rhythm Club programme. There was a coot in the background making a big old noise. Uh, um, many of his former colleagues... Um, arrived uh, to uh to, organized by melody maker to do a jam session at the abbey road studios um many were still sporting injuries obviously uh, two of them had got broken legs and you know, broken wrist and things like that and they recorded a, a special kind of tribute to ken after that um cafe de paris uh reopened 1948 uh, and it's it's been open ever since. Uh, it's a really nice place, a really opulent, nice club. They used it in some of the scenes in uh, in uh, Batman, uh, and you always find kind of films being uh, filmed there because it's it's really stunning when you go inside. Um, unfortunately, uh, when COVID happened, it closed down, and uh, because of that, owing to financial difficulties, it is now permanently shut, which is a real shame. So let's hope. I think, hmm, I thought, I thought someone was going to open it and use it as the, uh, the, uh, 
there was meant to be a Batman themed restaurant opening up in Soho, but I don't know whether that has opened up. I think that was mentioned pre COVID and obviously a lot of things have changed since then. Anyway, so that was the story of Ken Snakehips Johnson. Fascinating man. I love these stories about people who are just fantastic and wonderful and you just think, Oh god, you've had a lovely life. If only you would you would have been allowed to have even more of a life. Um so let's do the quest the quiz questions and then I can eat my donut. Yeah, priorities. Um question number one Which country did Ken come from? It was Guyana. Question number two. Which band leader did Ken idolise? It was Cab Calloway. If you, you can check out, if you want to know what kind of Ken's style was, um, there's a couple of clips online, but you can, if you check out Cab Calloway, um, you'll kind of get an idea of what he kind of liked. Um, Ken was a kind of a, a lot more, kind of a little more spirit and a lot more lithe version. But Cab Calloway did the, remember the, howdy, 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 Good song. I think it, it, it came back in the 90s, didn't it? They kind of, I think someone did a remix of it and everyone was like, oh, that's great. Um, question three. Which club was Ken having drinks at before his death? That was the Embassy Club. Question four, what did Ken's parents do as jobs? Uh, his mum was a nurse, his dad was a doctor and the Minister for Health. Question five, who owned the West End Dance School that Ken attended? That was Clarence Buddy Bradley. Uh, question six, which university did Ken probably go to? That was Edinburgh. Question seven. How many bottles of champagne were stockpiled for the Café de Paris opening? And other nights as well. Uh, 25,000 bottles of champagne, which keeps Eva going for about a week. Uh, question eight. Name one of the discs Ken's band released. Uh, they had four. It was uh, Goodbye, Remember, Washington Squabble, and Please Be Kind. Um, question nine. His musician said Ken couldn't tell a B flat from a what? It was a pig's foot. And question ten. Which famous occultist was Ken's boyfriend Gerald a former flatmate of? It was Alistair Crowley. Uh, also regarded as the wickedest man in Europe. So there we go. That was that. I hope you enjoyed that, folks. That was episode 150 uh, of Murder Mile. Next week, we've got another episode. Oh, another single. We've got single, 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 and then we end with a double. And then and then it's Christmas, and I'm going to start stockpiling uh, my booze for Christmas, as I like doing, uh, and then treat myself. And, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean it'd be Eva's booze, won't it, really? Let's be honest. Cool, that was it. Hope you enjoyed that episode, and we'll be back next week. Stay safe, be good. Lots of love. Bye.